Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo Alashibo Ale. We begin in North Africa, where the Tunisian government has denied that former Prime Minister Ahmadi Jibali has been arrested. A post on his official Facebook page said Mr. Jibali had been detained by the security forces. The Islamist and other party also demanded his release. But the Interior Ministry now says it's investigating a factory on land owned by the former leader's wife and that he'd insisted on accompanying her to the police station. Critics accused Tunisia's president, Kais Saeed, of trying to stifle dissent. Last year, he dissolved parliament and took executive powers. And protesters in Sudan are resuming their protest against government, demanding a change to civilian rule and also calling for justice for those killed by security forces during their demonstrations. Nevertheless, the latest march has been met with force, as always. This comes as international moves to reach a political deal has faltered. Security forces fired tear gas and stun grenades at protesters who rallied against Sudan's military rulers on Thursday as diplomatic moves to broker a political solution to a post-coup crisis showed little sign of progress. Thousands marched towards the presidential palace in Khartoum amid high temperatures and a high security presence in the first major demonstration since the first month of Ramadan and the biggest turnout for several weeks. You can see that this is just part of the repression of the forces with the rubber bullets, live bullets and a huge number of police forces of all kinds that are present today in Sharoni Square. Barbed wire and other forces, but protesters today are adamant and will continue in their path onto the fall of this coup. Crowds in the capital and others filmed in other cities on social media could be heard chanting, killers were not afraid, and the people's government is civilian. There's no other way than to bring in a civilian government. We reject a partnership with the military. They do not have legitimacy and we will not negotiate. We will keep at it until we achieve what we are here for, which is a civilian government, or to bring justice for our brothers who were killed. God willing, just as regimes were brought down once before, it will happen again. Sudan has been in political flux since months of mass demonstrations pushed the military into overthrowing former President Omar al-Bashir in April 2019. After more rallies, the army agreed to share power with civilian groups, but then took over again in a coup in October 2021. Since then, civilian parties, including resistance committees, organizing the protest, have rejected negotiation with the military. Military leaders have looked to factions that were close to Bashir to try to build a political base. Talks organized by the United Nations and the African Union that were expected to launch this week have stumbled amid heavy criticism from parts of the military and civil society. Khartoum resistance committees on Wednesday signed a charter setting out their vision for ending military rule, inviting political parties to join. There is no other way than to bring in a civilian government. We reject a partnership with the military. They do not have legitimacy and we will not negotiate. We will keep at it until we achieve what we are here for, which is a civilian government, or to bring justice for our brothers who were martyred. God willing, just as regimes were brought down once before, it will happen again. At least 95 people have been killed in protests since the coup and thousands injured, according to medics. Lawyers say dozens of political prisoners remain in detention. Military leaders say the deaths will be investigated, that those detained face criminal charges and that the coup was a corrective to political infighting. Good policies reviving crucial sectors such as the power industry are some of the ways to correct a number of inadequacies to make room for more development in Nigeria. This is the view of renowned Professor Emeritus of Georgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta, Augustine Esobue. Professor Esobue, who was involved in the development of infrastructure in the United States and many other developed countries, strongly believes that there are opportunities and a high level of expertise in the engineering sector in Nigeria if the right policy framework is put in place. 
have done some work through water resources in power generation for the state of California, and I've tried to export those tools here in terms of optimal operation of reservoirs. You know, network of reservoirs in the country, if you pull them together in terms of the op operations instead of the individual operations, you know, and look for optimal ways to do that, which we propose for the state of California, you know, and uh, trans uh, you know, they were also used by Texas when they developed their Texas water plan. You know, India, Brazil, all of them used some of those things we developed in the 60s in California, you know, that I was part of, you know. Um, those things can be done here in this country, you know, uh, if our people will listen. But to catch the full interview with Professor Augustine Esobue, do watch Diaspora Network on Saturday at 7.30 p.m. And in South Africa now, where President Cyril Ramaphosa has urged international organizations and donor agencies to buy COVID vaccines from African manufacturers, President Ramaphosa said this would ensure the developing capabilities on the continent are retained while speaking to a global summit on COVID. It comes as a vaccine manufacturer in South Africa risks stopping production for lack of orders. Aspen Pharmacare recently said it may have to stop production in its South African plant after being hit by low demand. However, the company negotiated a licensing deal in November to package and sell Johnson & Johnson's vaccine for distribution across Africa. And according to scientists, global warming is to blame for the devastating floods in South Africa that claimed the lives of hundreds of people. They say the natural disaster last month was as a result of the planet heating, making the heavy rains twice as likely. Global warming made the heavy rains behind South Africa's devastating floods last month twice as likely as they would have been if greenhouse gas emissions had never heated the planet. Flash floods around the eastern coastal city, Durban, killed 435 people and left tens of thousands homeless. 10 billion rand of damage, or around $622 million, was caused to roads, power lines, water pipes, and one of Africa's busiest ports. The World Weather Attribution Group analyzed weather data and digital simulations to compare today's climate with that before the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s, when the world was more than two degrees Fahrenheit cooler. A report of that study said such an extreme rainfall episode would be expected to happen about once every 40 years without human-caused global warming. That's now reduced, it said, to about once every 20 years. Attributing specific weather events to climate change is a tricky business that deals in probabilities and not certainty. However, co-author Frederick Otto of Imperial College, London, said the study had examined data from the wider region, not just Durban. Scientists say Africa's southeastern coast is on the front line of seaborne weather systems and climate change is intensifying. South Africa's northern neighbor, Mozambique, has suffered multiple cyclones and floods in the past decade, including one in April that killed more than 50 people. And the United Nations Humanitarian Affairs Agency says the world is not paying enough attention to crisis beyond the war in Ukraine, including a devastating drought in East Africa. The head of the organization, Martin Griffiths, made the appeal after visiting Turkana in northwest Kenya, where food is extremely scarce after a lengthy period without rainfall. People there are suffering from malnutrition, with some left too, too weak to stand or walk. The UN World Food Programme says 20 million people across East Africa are at risk of severe hunger. And climate change expert Olumide Idowu joins us now from Tanzania for more on this. Thank you so much for joining us on the programme. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. So famine and drought seems to be rapidly escalating in East Africa as a result of numerous factors. What can be done to manage the situation? Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, going straight to the point, uh, we need to understand that uh, this part of 
the world, which is the East Africa, is very, very you know, important when it comes to the conversation of the environment. But looking at the farming issue and drought that is going on, number one, they need to start looking at the economic growth. What are the uh, in investment they are putting into the economic growth of the country, of the, con uh, the, the side of East Africa? And what is the progress in fighting against poverty? Both, uh, poverty? Because one of the uh, issues we see now, when there's no food in the land, then people don't tend to function as they, they're supposed to function. And we need to start looking at how we can encourage uh, what we call uh, proper sanitation, how we can make government accountable because what we see now is that most of them are not accountable for their promises towards the people in the land. So the land will continue to have that issue if we don't put the proper accountability in place. And if we don't see how we can leverage on the economic that is giving us the opportunity we have now. So economic growth is very important. And the progress, what progress are they putting in fighting uh, against poverty so that the people that are the receiving end can have the opportunity to have a good livelihood and be able to sustain their living as well. And, you know, we've been speaking about climate change uh, time and time and uh, time again. Um, how can governments better prepare for the impact of climate change? And are there practical steps people can take in mitigating the effects of climate change that we see now today? Thank you very much. Uh, like my mentor always say, climate change is a time bomb. And if all don't take urgent action, it's going to, you know, start eating deep into the system. So I would rather say that you and I, individual action, contribution is what can help us to mitigate and adapt. And look at the side of Africa. We need to start looking at that adaptation issues. And as mitigation is more of a technical part of it. But the point here is, how can we solve the poor governance that is linking to climate politics, that is making our promises or our demand not more effective when it comes to solving environment or climate change problem? So if you and I can start looking at how I can switch off my light when there is, is not necessary to use it for that time, how you and I can make sure that sanitation and hygiene is more well uh, approached. How can I solve open defecation? All those things that are related to adaptation and mitigation is very, very important. And let me end by saying that what of climate finance? Finance is needed to mitigate and to adapt. So how can we start looking at those steps to make sure that uh, poor governance doesn't take away the solution that we need for the grassroots and for the livelihood of the people? So different uh, individual action contribute to solution that we're looking to when it comes to climate action. And it's interesting, we're talking about individual action here in Africa, uh, but scientists have said that Africa does contribute the least to global warming. But do you think uh, the rest of the world is doing enough to, you know, mitigate the impact of climate change in terms of funding? Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we need to get it very right. You know, when we say human induced, human factor, meaning that we that stays in, the, in that locality are the ones that is contributing to this issue. So let us first of all look at ourselves inwardly. How can we mitigate or can we adapt internally, individually? But you are not talking about the international world. There's what we have, international governance. It, the bilateral conversation between our government and the institution that is actually pumping money into the system to solve climate issue need to be concrete, need to have some sort of a, a, a conversation that will help us to understand whether this money they are promising is towards adaptation and mitigation or whether they are just using us or just looking at, oh, let us give them something to solve their problem. Uh, let me take you back a little bit before I cut now. If you remember the 100 billion package, for climate financing, up to today, since 2019, they have been promising COP25. We've not seen the outcome. Where is the money? And they keep promising and promising. So Africa is at the edge of where we need to start looking inwardly to see how we can solve our climate crisis ourselves. And not only solving our climate crisis ourselves, our leaders need to start looking at climate governance. It's very, very important so that the opportunity we have now as agriculture, and other related opportunities that is giving us our own daily income, we need to start leveraging on those things so that the issue of climate change or financing 
will not be what we are going to be waiting for international government. And I'm not saying there should not be international col uh, collaboration, but mm. we need to, you know, get to that point where we need to understand what is needed for us to mitigate and to adapt when it comes to climate change issues. All right, then, climate change expert Olumide Idowu, thank you so much for your thoughts on Network Africa. Thank you very much. Mali's army chief has ended a three-day visit to Rwanda as the country seeks to strengthen bilateral defense cooperation. Malian General Umar Dayara concluded a three-day visit to Rwanda uh, during which he met with President Paul Kagame and the Minister of Defense at the Rwanda Defense Forces headquarters in Kigali. According to a statement by the Rwanda Ministry of Defense, a bilateral defense collaboration was on the agenda and the discussion between the two men tackled different aspects of cooperation in human resource development, military training and welfare. Mali's army chief said the purpose of his trip was to exchange experience and expertise on capacity building of both the Rwanda Defense Force and Malian Armed Forces. The last major Rwandan fugitive indicted by a war crimes court for his role in the 1994 genocide has been confirmed dead. Retias Mprania was head of the presidential guard and was accused of ordering the murder of the then prime minister Agathe Wilingiamana and his officers also murdered the 10 Belgian UN peacekeepers guarding her. Investigators tracked him down to Zimbabwe, where a recently exhumed grave confirmed he had died in 2006. They found that Mprania had used various aliases whilst on the run to evade capture for over 12 years. In the immediate aftermath of the genocide, in which about 800,000 ethnic Tutsis and moderate Hutus were killed by ethnic Hutu extremists in 100 days, he is said to have moved to Cameroon. And a Rwandan court in Kigali has ruled that the case hearing of the Miss Rwanda pageant organizer accused of sex crimes be held behind closed doors to protect witnesses. The organizer, Diodin Ishimwe, widely known in Rwanda as Prince Kid, is accused of rape, soliciting or offering sexual favors and harassment against the pageant contesters. He was set to plead to the charges during a bell hearing today. As soon as the proceedings began, the prosecutor requested that the trial be held in secret, citing more reasons because of the sexual nature of the case and protection of witnesses. However, Mr. Ishimiwe objected, requesting that the hearing should be open for the public to follow and note the outcome. In the end, a judge ruled that the hearing should go on behind closed doors and the public and journalists were immediately ordered out of the courtroom. The case is currently one of the most discussed issues by Rwandans on social platforms. Last week, the Culture Ministry suspended the Miss Rwanda contest, while its 2017 winner, Elsa Irudukunda, was arrested in connection to Mr. Ishimiwe's case. And back here in Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari has thanked the minister seeking elective offices in 2023 in a valedictory service at the council chamber today. In a briefing after the meeting of the outgoing ministers, the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, disclosed that 10 ministers in total are leaving and were physically present uh, today. According to him, some of the ministers have tendered their resignation, while the others are in the process of doing so. The president has, however, thanked them all for their compliance and cooperation as he admonished the remaining members of cabinet to be more diligent and committed to the success of the administration. President Buhari equally disclosed the vacated seats would be replaced very soon. Now, you will recall that it's the last Federal Executive Council meeting held Wednesday, 11th May 2022. I directed that all ministers and other political appointees who aspire to contest for elective offices in the 2023 general elections should resign their current appointments. I note that some have complied while others are in the process of doing so. I would like to use this opportunity to commend your decision and courage 
to contest for elective offices and your compliance with my directive. I also wish to thank you for your invaluable services to this nation through your contributions as cabinet members. I wish you success in the upcoming elections and in your future endeavors. The departure of some cabinet members has undoubtedly created a vacuum that should be filled, that will be carried without delay so that the business of governance will not suffer. For members of the cabinet that are remaining on board, I wish to remind you that the journey to the finish line is very far, and this calls for more diligence, resilience, and commitment to serve Nigerians better. You must therefore brace up for more work and target increased accomplishments. The determination to leave important legacies for Nigerians should never be compromised. I thank you once again. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Nigeria's President Mohamed Buhari speaking there. Elsewhere in West Africa, family members are anxiously wait awaiting news of eight miners who have been missing for nearly a month after they were trapped on the ground in Burkina Faso during a flood. They include six Burkina Faso citizens, one Tanzanian and one Zambian who went missing on the 16th of April after heavy rainfall caused flash floods at the Canadian-owned mine, forcing it to suspend operations. Government says hopes to find the missing workers are slowly fading as rescuers remain with about 10 metres of water above a refuge chamber. The families of eight missing miners in Burkina Faso desperately awaited news from rescue teams as efforts continue to locate the men who have been stuck on the ground for 26 days. There has been no communication with the miners since they were trapped more than 500 meters below ground during a flood at Canada-based Trivali Mining Corps, the Koa Zinc Mine, on April 16th. For Bama, wife of one of the trapped miners, she hopes her husband returns home safe. I'm looking at photos of my husband. I miss him a lot. Today it has been 26 days since he left home. We have hope. We know they will come back. We're really counting on God. Antoine Bama, brother of one of the trapped miners, left his home in the capital, Ouagadougou, to stay with the family and provide support after the accident. He tries to stay positive for the sake of his brother's children, ranging in age from about 6 to 20. Burkina Faso's Labour Minister, Basel Mabazi, said the water samples had to be studied for safety reasons before rescuers could go underwater to try to reach the chamber. We are organizing for rescue teams to dive into the area and do some checks. But to dive in mining waters that have been circulating in the mine, we need to analyze a few samples. Distraught family members have been meeting each day at the site in central Burkina Faso, Sangui province, to offer each other moral support as they wait for any news concerning their loved ones. And finally on the program, global tech giant Google has added 24 new languages spoken by more than 300 million people to its Google Translate platform. Ten of the new additions are in Africa, including Lingala from Democratic Republic of Congo, Twi in Ghana, and Tigrinya from Eritrea. Other African languages added are spoken in Togo, Sierra Leone, Mali, South Africa, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Namibia, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. The update now brings to 133 the total number of languages available on Google Translate. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenyo Alash Shibuale. Have a lovely weekend.